Hi everyone, I'm Elenki Hano. It's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. It was a big day for both chambers of Congress today. On the Senate side, four of the Trump administration's top health experts testified on efforts to contain the coronavirus. It took place as the number of new cases continues to rise in several states. The hearing was scheduled as an update on progress toward getting back to work and back to school. According to the nation's top infectious disease, Dr. Anthony Fauci, that progress is not going well. The numbers speak for themselves. I'm very concerned and I'm not satisfied with what's going on because we're going in the wrong direction. Clearly, we are not in total control right now. Meanwhile, some House Democrats left the White House today expressing frustration after a closed-door briefing on Russia bounty allegations. A person in the room says members of the administration spent too much time debating the sourcing and timeline of reports suggesting Russia was paying Taliban fighters to kill U.S. troops and too little time addressing the substance of the reports. According to the New York Times, President Trump was given a written briefing on possible Russian bounties on American troops once in late February. The paper reports that investigators are focused on an April 2019 attack where three U.S. Marines were killed by explosives by their armored vehicles near Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan. House Democrats say they were also frustrated that the briefing was led by White House officials, not intelligence agencies. Here's Intelligence Committee Chair Adam Schiff after the meeting. The right people to give the briefing really were not in the room. Uh, we need to hear from the heads of the intelligence agencies um, about how they assess the allegations uh, that have been made publicly. Um, what can they tell us about the truth or falsity of these allegations? What can they tell us about steps they are undertaking or have undertaken uh, to vet uh, any information that they may have? Last night, CIA Director Gina Haspel and Director of National Intelligence John Ratcliffe released rare public statements attacking the leaks. Haspel said publishing the report, quote, compromises and disrupts government intelligence efforts. Director Ratcliffe took it a step further, calling it a crime. That was a message White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany echoed at today's press briefing. There is no good scenario as a result of this New York Times report. Who's going to want to co cooperate with the United States intelligence community? Who's going to want to be a source or an asset if they know that their identity could be disclosed? Which allies will want to share information with us if they know that some rogue intelligence officer can go splash that information on the front page of a major U.S. newspaper? CBS News intelligence and national security reporter Olivia Gazas joins me now with more. Hi, Olivia. It's good to see you. A lot to sort through today. First, what do we know about the actual intelligence on whether the Russian government was paying the Taliban bounties on American troops? Elaine, it's great to be with you. And uh, yes, we've certainly come a long way on this story since it first broke on Friday. Uh, what we do know is a few things. For one, we know this intelligence exists. We know that it was circulated to a number of stakeholders, namely the president's national security team, some members of Congress, and our allies overseas, namely the British. We know what it indicates, that the Russians uh, were offering bounties to Taliban-linked mil militia groups uh, to kill U.S. or coalition troops in Afghanistan. That leads us to what we don't know. What we don't know is the confidence level in any of these uh, intelligence findings. As you know, the intelligence uh, community can ascribe low, medium, or high confidence to a given finding, and we know nothing about uh, how robust the intelligence on these items is. We do know that it, is, it was credible enough to be circulated, though. Uh, we also don't know how big a slice of the sort of intelligence pie it is. We don't know if this is the worst thing that the Russians were doing, uh, if this is part of a constellation of other things they might have been planning. Uh, you know, this could be a sort of narrow selection of the type of, of things that the intelligence community is looking into. So that's unknown number two. Unknown number three is, of course, how much the president knew about this as it was developing as an intelligence topic. Uh, we have heard, of course, from the White House that he was never personally briefed on this front. 
This amid press reports that indicate uh, that at least a written item appeared in the president's daily brief, that uh, daily compendium of the top national security uh, intelligence that the president and a small group of advisors have access to. And those are the three, I would say, main open questions that we have about what this intelligence indicated. So I just want to clarify, is there potentially documentation then to verify whether the president was briefed on this information? So, yes, it depends a little bit on your definition of briefed, but what we uh, have seen multiple outlets report thus far is that a written item did appear uh, about this intelligence in the president's daily brief at some point uh, during this spring. So uh, that is, of course, uh, you know, uh, a highly classified document, and we know that only the president and a small universe of officials have access to it. So it's not as though it's as easy as pulling a public record to verify whether or not it happened. It would require an extraordinary move like declassification by the White House or a media leak, leak that could be uh, prosecuted in order for us to have eyes on that document. Thus far, the White House has, shown, ha House has shown no indication that it wants to forge ahead with transparency as to what the president received in his written PDB or not. So, Olivia, give us some context here. Why would it be significant if the president was actually briefed on these alleged bounties? Well, it goes to two things, Elaine. It goes to uh, what the president was might have been willing to do in order to exact costs from Russia, if in fact this was going on, uh, and it had to, and it has to do uh, with what he's doing to protect our troops. His awareness of those two things might have put in place uh, measures or protocols that would that that uh, a potential threat of this sort might have been necessary. You know, again, the White House is arguing that uh, that incomplete intelligence, non-actionable intelligence, rarely makes it to the president's desk. I will say that I spoke with a number of former senior intelligence officials who say, you know, that's not really true, that, that uh, intelligence that, is, that doesn't have universal analytic agreement from all of the agencies does often make it to the White House. It just depends how, how high the stakes are and whether uh, it makes sense to have the president have an awareness of something even as it evolves, even if it has low confidence, even if there is dissent among the agencies, uh, which is common. But again, if the president had an awareness, it might have informed his conversations with foreign leaders like Vladimir Putin. Would he have made the same decision to invite uh, Russia back into the G7? Would he have issued a joint statement with Vladimir Putin? Might he have issued a verbal warning, even based on preliminary intelligence, uh, rather than sort of not addressing it at all. Uh, so that can be sort of the important calculus of informing a given stakeholder uh, of what is percolating out there, what is even being investigated. Um, and one more on sort of the process here, with respect to how this particular president consumes this information. So there is that daily brief, the presidential daily brief, the PDV, as you call it, uh, that has that compilation of that sort of threat matrix for that day. That's paper, right? But there are also these face-to-face -face briefings that are delivered, Olivia. How often do we know of those take place with this administration? And what would rise to that level that would require, is this sort of a regular weekly or every two weeks kind of event that takes place? Sure. So it's important to note that every president is a different consumer of intelligence, and the intelligence community is prepared for this, right? So in the case of uh, President Bush, he liked to talk it out. He liked to have his CIA director in the room, his top aides in the room, and he liked to have written materials in the room, and he liked to go over it all in real time. Uh, president Obama was a reader. He liked to read the PDB first and then discuss at a later time his sort of preferred items with national security aides. Uh, President Trump, what we understand about his reading and intelligence, intelligence consumption habits is that he's less of a reader, more of a talker. Uh, so the, the oral presentation is more important for him. Uh, and he likes pictures and he likes sort of easily digested information. Uh, and so, again, the intelligence community is 
prepared for this. They know that their number one customer, the president, needs to have intelligence delivered to him the way that he best consumes it. Uh, and, and that's not sort of a contentious view. So it would be incumbent on the intelligence leaders here uh, to make sure that if there was something of credibility and urgency that the president needed to hear, that it was delivered to him in the way that they could best understand that he would uh, absorb it and act on it if he needed to. Um, finally, Olivia, in our final minute or so, how rare is it for intelligence, intelligence chiefs to go on the record to address public news reports? Right. So, Elaine, these are typically black boxes, you know, who issue you a, a no comment on a good day. Uh, you know, to hear from CIA Director Gina Haspel uh, is a rarity in its own right. I think she's only made a handful of very generic public statements uh, in her two-year tenure in the role. So that written statement that was issued just yesterday was extraordinary for her. That said, it wasn't necessarily specific to this story. We can understand that it's associated with this story. It spoke obliquely about the effect of unauthorized disclosures on intelligence collection, on intelligence verification, uh, on intelligence attrib on attribution that might uh, subsequently take place in uh, sort of, you know, ascribing blame to a given actor for a given act. Uh, so. It's not a secret that intelligence agencies don't like leaks. Probably most intelligence officers wouldn't mind if we, the fourth estate, disappeared. Uh, that said, what she didn't say was also important, namely that this intelligence doesn't exist and that it hadn't been briefed to the relevant stakeholders. In fact, she indicated that it had been. Right. A really significant point there. Olivia Gaz, is always good to have your reporting and analysis. Thank you very much. Thanks, Elaine.